or just tell us where you're watching from. We love to hear where people are watching from so that we can pray for you and and hopefully someday you'll come and see us. All right. So hold your Bibles up. Say, this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what the Bible says I can do. Today I'll be taught the Word of God. And I boldly confess my mind is alert. My heart is receptive. And I will never be the same again. Never, never, never. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Y'all are alive and well. So good. Well, we're finishing this series today on, on uh, IQ. We talked about cultural IQ, emotional IQ, relational IQ. Um, today, we're finishing with mental IQ. Uh, seems to be the pride of people measuring their lives by test scores instead of biblical knowledge. And having a biblical IQ... Is so important because as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And so our thought life and how we have developed our thinking will determine the outcome of our lives. Not where we were raised, not by whom we were raised, but by the mindset uh, that we possess. Paul said this, he said, do you not know that you have the mind of Christ? Um, all of us have been impacted by how we were raised to some degree, the culture in which we were raised, and a lot of our mindset, really without even being aware of it, comes from the people that we were around the first 16 to 18 years of our lives. Now, you have to understand, I'm not, you don't have to stay there. Uh, I've told many of you have heard me tell the story of my father, who was raised in a family of 12. They were extremely poor, didn't have his first pair of shoes till he was five years old. And so my father somehow managed to say, I don't want to live the rest of my life this way. And he increased his thinking by th thinking, okay, if I work hard and I'm consistent, I won't have to live this way and my kids won't have to. However, he did not have what I would call a prosperous mindset. He had a mindset of, I'm going to have enough to get by. And that really satisfies religious people. Religious people love that. Well, you don't need any more than that. You just need the bare minimum. Well, and that's okay if that's how you want to live, but don't criticize people who listen to Jesus. He said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Not more minimally, but more abundantly. And so people who have an abundant life mentality, uh, financially, emotionally, spiritually, mentally, oftentimes you're criticized because you say, you know, isn't enough enough? It would be if we didn't serve a God who said, I'm more than enough. And so as you, as you develop this mindset and your capacity to think bigger expands, you will be criticized. You'll be judged, and religious people will be mad at you. I read this recently. It says a religious person will do what he's told no matter what's right. In other words, they'll follow a doctrine that is a doctrine of man that interpreted their understanding of the Bible. And I'm not being critical of that because that's just where they are. And, and you get into this mindset. I grew up in a church where if you had any wealth at all, you were considered a heathen. As a matter of fact, you were applauded for barely getting by because their feeling was that you cared so much about God, you didn't care about anything else, which is not true. If you really care about God, think about this. When you are blessed, happy, and prosperous, you are giving glory to your creator saying, look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done. And it's, it's not showing off. It's showing out and saying, this is what my God does for those who trust him, those who serve him, those who bless him, those who worship him. This is what God will do for you. Now, if you don't want that, that's fine. If, if you want the bare minimum, I mean, at the end of my dad's life, I had a conversation with him, and I wasn't, I just had dreams in me. I don't know where it came from. I just, I've always, when I wasn't born again, 
I thought there's got to be more than what I'm experiencing in my little world. And my dad got mad at me because one day I just decided I was going to do something fun. I was going to get on a motorcycle and I was just going to ride across America. And of course, no dad wants to hear that from a kid that's 19 and pretty broke. <laughs> and uh, he said, Mark, he said, look, life is not a merry-go-round. And I had a response that I didn't know where it came from at the time, but I do now. I said, Dad, life is what you make it, and I'm going to make it something special. And at the time, I didn't even know God. I mean, I was working on a construction site, and uh, I, I'd be, we, we'd be out on this site, just me and the, the, the owner's son driving bulldozers. That'll give you an adrenaline rush. And when you're lost, it's really a rush. And so I remember laying on, a, on the ground at lunch one day, and, and, and the guy's name was Roscoe. <laughs> what a name. Probably a Roscoe watching right now. Anyway, it was a really dear friend, and, and I looked up in the sky, and there was an airplane going across the sky. And I looked, and I looked at Roscoe, and I said, someday I will be on airplanes flying around the world. I was lost as a goose in a snowstorm. And guess what? Those words came to pass, and I'm four million miles later on American Airlines in my life. I didn't know the power of words. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. You be careful what you say, and God will take care. You see, you and I have this ability, this capacity to declare as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Whatever you're having faith for is giving honor to God. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. So sometimes people will judge you for what you're having faith for because they don't have faith for the same thing. And then they will accuse you of being greedy for having faith for that which you're having faith for. Now, again, I don't want to be mean, and I don't want you to, to get mad at people who disagree. I just want you to keep having faith. I want you to keep declaring what the Word of God declares. And sometimes it doesn't happen overnight. For me, that Word at 19, 20 years old didn't really start happening for 15 to 20 years later when I started training leaders all over the world, starting in Cape Town, South Africa, from London, England, to Santiago, Chile, that, that, that all of this didn't happen overnight. It happened over time. And if we don't lose heart and we don't lose faith and our minds continue to expand as we, we read the Word of God, it begins to change us, changes us. Just recently, uh, we were on a, getting ready to fly, and uh, we were on one of these shuttle buses. You know, you park at the airport, and it's, it's just crazy. And so you have to get on a shuttle bus to take you to the terminal. And so we get on the shuttle bus, been doing this now for 40 years. And there was a couple already seated on there. They picked us up, and there was just one other couple, and they were sitting up toward where the driver, uh, toward the driver. And I always sit in the back because I want to be able to see everybody and listen. And uh, so sure enough, I was not disappointed the driver turns and says, you know, what airline are you flying? They told him, and I told him mine. And then they, he goes, well, how's everything going? Well, the wife up front sitting next to her husband goes, it's going to be, it's a good day. And her husband replied, well, the day ain't over yet. <laughs> My physical self wanted to get up and choke him and say, wow, you just discounted your wife's faith that today is going to be a good day. And, you know, sometimes we get up, it's rainy, it's cold, it's windy. It's Oklahoma, where the wind comes sweeping down the plains. And uh, Anyway, and so, you know, it's, it's like not every day is a favorable day for your mind. That's why you have to know Jesus, the one who gives favor. We have to put our confidence in him, not in the weather, not in our ability, not in our skill, but knowing in our deficiency, he is all sufficient. So whatever you lack, if you put faith in him, he will make up for it. 
Some of you have depended on your report card and your test scores. But let me tell you something. God is bigger than your test scores. He's bigger than your IQ. He is all about believing in him. He didn't go to Harvard and Yale to pick Peter, James, and John. (laughs) These guys were like zeros who became heroes. God doesn't pick the qualified. He qualifies the picked. So quit measuring whether or not you can be or you can do based on you. Believe based on him where nothing is impossible. Nothing. But you have to expand your thinking, your capacity. When things are not good, things are not going well, things don't look right, God is still God. And I'm telling you, he's still surprising the world today. And he will continue because his ways are higher than ours. His thoughts are higher than ours. And sometimes the worst day becomes the brightest day because in that depth of darkness, a pin light shines and it makes everything bright. In the darkness of life, he is the light of the world. And if we will look to him... And not talk about where we are and what we don't have and what's not going right for us. Declare what you're going to have. Quit talking about what you don't have. Start getting up every day and declaring, this is what I'm going to see. And eventually, hell will go, what are they talking about? And God knows, I know exactly what they're saying. And I'm going to bless the faith they're demonstrating right now. I'm going to give you four points to expanding your thinking today. Four points. Very simple. Number one, seek. Seek in the Greek means desire, passion. That's how come we, we've got to seek the right things. Seek God. The Bible says seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and everything else will be added to you. The challenge is, if I were to ask some of you today, what's your passion, what's your desire, you would literally have to pause to think about it because you haven't meditated on it. The second thing is sample. The Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. In a moment, I'll get to that point, and it's a very important point for you to experience the things of God. Sometimes all we need is one little miracle to change how we think. In my life, it took one miracle. When I got born again, I had an injury from past sports injury where my neck was all messed up. I couldn't even raise my right arm. It was a, a situation where they said, we're going to cut on your neck. We're going we're to scrape your spine. How many of you know you didn't go, oh, well, praise the Lord. Can we schedule that for tomorrow? I just can't wait to have my spine scraped. But I was so scared. I'd never had surgery in my life, and and this was not one I wanted to have because the thought of them cutting here, and I've watched enough Grey's Anatomy. (laughs) And so I'm thinking, this is not good. And and God simply to me, this is a new born-again Christian. I I mean, I, I I never read the Bible because I still don't understand King James. You know, if you can read King James and understand it, you need to be a theologian. And so I, I didn't know, but, uh, but I just knew I didn't want surgery. How many of you know, sometimes we pray and ask God to help us out of fear, not of faith. <laughs> At that point, I didn't have faith. I had fear, which became faith when God said, if you'll lift your hands and worship me, I will heal you. And over time, I gradually would do this. You know, I, I would never lift my hands up high. I thought y'all were crazy. I thought, well, can't we just go to church and hear some little sermonette and smoke a cigarette and, you know, whatever. And so, I'm, you know, I'm just freshly born again here. And so I do this and then this. And finally, God said, nah, 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 nah. when I lifted my hands and said, I abandon all, God said, then you have all. Never had the surgery. <laughs> Devil still tries to bring it back to me with my arms going numb and, and not being able to feel. And every now and then he tries to trick me. I said, Devil, this is done. I was healed a long time ago. So long ago that some of you weren't even a thought in your mom and dad's mind. Yeah, it is right. So in Proverbs 4, chapter 3, it says, "When This is out of the Message Bible. When I was a boy at my father's knee, the pride and joy of my mother, he would sit me down and drill me. Take this to heart. Do what I tell you. Live. 
Sell everything and buy wisdom. Forage for understanding. Don't forget one word. Don't deviate an inch. Never walk away from wisdom. She guards your life. Love her. She keeps her eye on you. Wisdom is her name. Above all and before all, do this, get wisdom. Write this at the top of your list. Get understanding. Throw your arms around your list or, or around her. Believe me, you won't regret it. Never let her go. She'll make your life glorious. She'll garland your life with grace. She will festoon your days with beauty. In other words, developing a capacity, increasing it. Somebody said one time, knowledge is knowing what to say. Wisdom is knowing when to say it. So they work together. Once you get knowledge, you begin to declare what God's truths are. The very first scripture in my life that I began to live by and stand on was, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. That is still my number one scripture. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Nothing is impossible with God. Surely, O oh Lord, you bless the righteous. You surround us with favor as with a shield. Some of y'all complain about what you don't have and how you were raised and what you've missed out on and all the regrets. Everybody in this room, if I could ask, everybody has regrets. And the devil would love for you to focus on your past and your regrets instead of your future and your faith that something good is going to happen happen to you today every day that you get up today is my day something good is happening today my life is going to change today i have the favor of god today i live under the grace umbrella of my lord and savior jesus christ his mercies are new this morning these are things that you can control you're not controlling God. You're giving God control. Saying, God, my life belongs to you. I've been bought with a price. It's no longer my own. It belongs to you. I am going to go from glory to glory. My footsteps are ordered by you today. I'm going to be where I need to be, when I need to be there, around who I need to be. That's what's going to happen today. Thank all 15.5% of you. See... We've lost our passion, our desire. What do you desire more than anything today? Are you just going through the motions? Are you doing what the world says you ought to be doing and you know, doing the things that you think are right? Or are you saying, God, if there are things in my life that need to change today, I'm going to change them. And it may not meet everybody's expectations and everybody may not agree with me, but I really don't care. You know, there will be people that will tell you going to church is a waste of time. You don't have to go to church to go to heaven. Yeah, but you'll pay hell getting to heaven without church. Let me just tell you, the Bible says don't forsake the assembling of yourself together as you see the day drawing near. And we're living in a world where church has become an option instead of the priority in our lives. And the world, the world system is not conducive to the faith that we have. Matter of fact, they'll do everything in the world to keep you out of church. And we are busy in the name of Jesus. And some of us need to become less busy and more focused on passion and desire to be in the house of God. Because it's in the house of God you flourish. You're not going to flourish at work. You might make a great living, but you're going to flourish in the house of God because you planted yourself here. And it will cost you something. Christianity comes with a sacrifice. I don't get to live life the way I want to live it sometimes. Come on, let's get real, huh? If you got flesh today, you got flesh. And there are just things I look and say, God, I don't want to forgive. They're knuckleheads. They deserve to be. Punish them, God. Sick them. You say, well, a preacher would say that? Yeah, any preacher would tell you the truth. Here are people, you, you want to say the words like old King James, smite them, O Lord Almighty. Be thou smited. We all have that happening. This is why we have to keep the word of God in our brain and our heart and, and, and let it sit there. We have to have a passion. We can't just have this, well, you know, I think I might go to church. I, I think I might serve the Lord. I, I think I might believe. I think I... Uh, 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 uh. We have to commit to what we believe in order to increase the capacity of our faith. And it begins by simply saying, God...
I desire what you desire. The Bible says if you'll delight yourself in the Lord, he will give you the desires of your heart. That's seeking. You may remember this story. There was a, a beggar who used to every day sit at this gate called Beautiful. It was right at the temple gate. And people were coming in and out of the temple to serve God and to pray. And every day, somehow, somebody would carry this beggar, crippled man, to the gate, beautiful. And he had a cup. And every day, he would sit there with this cup and ask people to put money in it. Now, I will give him credit for this. At least he had the tenacity to have somebody carry him there. But even though he was at the gate, beautiful an entrance to the temple, he still had a cup mentality. He wasn't there to believe that the God they worshipped could heal him and give him the strength to walk again. He was simply there to make enough money to live and survive every day. You see, he had a limited capacity, a limited understanding of the God that they were going in to serve. And then one day, two guys who had had an encounter with Jesus... They weren't Harvard grad. They weren't Oral Roberts University grads. They weren't Yale grads. These were rough, cantankerous fishermen that Jesus picked to follow. And he's begging with his cup. And Peter walks by and he asks for money from Peter. And Peter looks at him and simply says in one translation, Silver and gold have I none. In another translation, Peter said, I don't have a nickel to my name. He said, but what I do have. Now, this is where it gets really stretchy. This guy's thinking, I just need to fill my cup. How many of you know we serve a God that says, my cup runneth over. Don't ask me to just fill it. Ask me to flood it. Ask me to make it overflow. Ask me so everybody can see what's about to happen, that I am a God of miracles. I'm a supernatural God. I don't want to fill your cup. I want it to overflow so everybody gets a little something, something. He had a cup mentality until Peter said, get up and walk. Now, he just, this dude didn't just get up and go, oh, this is cool. No, he became full-on Pentecostal. He went leaping and shouting and praising the Lord. Can you see Peter and John going, wait, wait, dude, chill. Hey, <laughs> you're going to run everybody off. Now, here's what happened. He showed other people there's a miracle working God inside this temple. There's a miracle working God outside this temple. The question is, will you seek him? Will you desire him? Will you have a passion for him? Will you believe him? Will you get up when he says get up? Or will you hang on to your cup? A lot of people still hanging on to their little cup. I'm born again. Nothing's happened good for me. Where's my cup? Get my cup. You still carrying your cup around? Throw your cup away today. Get rid of your cup. Say, God, I have a desire beyond what my cup can contain. My container has expanded. My mentality has expanded. My faith has expanded. I'm no longer believing you for the bare minimum. I'm coming to you with a passion for the bare maximum that you have for my life. I want it to be pressed down. I want it to be shaken together. I want it to be running over. God, I want more. I expect more. And religious people say, oh, you shouldn't do that. Don't bother God. Come on. Do you think you can bother the one who made heaven and earth and the Milky Way and the galaxies with your little bitty prayer? Religious people will always hold you back. You're believing for too much. Why are you praying for that? Isn't enough enough? No, 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 no. You keep remembering he's the God of more than enough. He's not a little cup God. you got to get rid of the cup mentality. Now, you can get mad at me today cause, because right now you're saying, man, we're barely making it. I, I've been serving the law for 20 years. I don't know what's going to happen to me now. Don't you ever stop believing. 
Don't ever give up your faith. Don't ever give up your hope. Don't ever give up on your dreams. He said, but I'm tired. Get re-energized. Seek the Lord while he may be found. And he can be found. He ain't playing hide and seek. Some of y'all think he's hiding from you. Your family say, God ain't ever done nothing for our family. We grew up on the wrong side of the tracks. Well, then get you a pickaxe and go change the tracks, Jack. <laughs> Either that or move your house. But don't blame the tracks for what you don't have. Well, I don't care where you grew up. I just care that you're growing up. And you're standing up. You're speaking up. You're jumping up. You got rid of the cup. You decided, I have more in me. And you are, your family will discount you. i never forget when I changed denominations, it was an abomination. They said, why, why aren't you going to church where we always went to church? I said, because I'm dying in your dead church. Y'all talk about Jesus coming back. Jesus coming back. Everybody going to die. Okay, I know those two things. I got those. None of us get out of this alive. I know that. I don't need to hear that every Sunday. And I know he's coming back. I don't want to wait till he comes back to get what he's got. I want to get it now. Jesus said, pray be on earth as it is in heaven. I want peace that passes understanding. I want a joy unspeakable. I want to press down, shaken together, and running over life. I want to see the blessing of God so I can be the blessing of God to other people. You can't bless somebody unless you're blessed. You can't love somebody unless you love. You can't do something you don't do. You can't have something you can't give what you don't have. We're sitting around waiting on the Lord. I'm such a good Christian. I'm just waiting on the Lord. And guess what? The Lord's just waiting on you. I got news for you. He can outweigh you. Lord, would you do something? The Lord said, would you do something? He said, because without faith, I, I can't do anything. That's what pleases me. Are you pressing in? Are you pressing in to believe me? Are you talking about what all the things that happened to you in life, all the bad things? I can't believe nothing good ever happened to me. Instead of saying, my best days are ahead. I've had a great life, but I'm going to tell you something. The former is not going to compare to the latter because I'm going to suck all the life out of life I can get. Some of y'all need to hook up to the life of God. Sitting and sitting around waiting on the Lord. What the Bible says, those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. Have you ever thought about it this way? You become a waiter when you wait on the Lord. You're carrying everything around, serving him, waiting, waiting, waiting on him, waiting on his people, waiting on him. Right there. You see... We have to be proactive Christians. John Maxwell put it this way. People change when they hurt enough they have to. Some of y'all ain't hurt bad enough yet to where you go, i got to do something different. The definition of insanity, doing the same thing, expecting different results. Some of y'all been doing the same thing, which is going to church and complaining. It's too hot. It's too cold. Music is too loud. The preaching sucks. Mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm. <laughs> And then you go out and say, well, glory to God. No, you complainer, whiner. Seen about you. Sometimes it's just, I hear this every Sunday. It was hot in there today. It was cold in there today. The music was too loud. The music was too soft. You preached too short. You preached too long. <laughs> I'm going to start passing out binkies at the door. Just come and worship God. Quit saying all about you. It's all about him. Yeah, it may be a little warm. Let me tell you something. This will remind you, you don't want to go to hell. I think every now and then we just need to turn it up to sauna level. Sweat for Jesus. You know the old saying, those who sweat together stick together. Hey.
when they see enough, they're inspired to. People change. At the gate, beautiful, there were a lot more lives changed than that crippled cup holder. Why? Because all of a sudden they saw something happen that they've been waiting on to happen. And they were inspired enough to say, if it happened for him, it can happen to me. Too many of y'all looking at people who've crashed and burned. If it happened to them, it's probably going to happen to me. And you're probably right because that's what you're focused on. But when you look and say, it might have happened to them, but their experience changed my experience. That ain't happening to me. I'm going to believe Jesus for something different than that. When they learn enough, they want to get knowledge. And when they receive enough, they're able to. Second thing is sample. Some people never sample the things of God. They never sample church. They never sample prayer. They never sample faith. They never sample anything. Therefore, they never see anything. They don't even have a passion or desire to sample and say, well, maybe God would do something if I got involved. Some of y'all, that chair you're sitting in, it's got your imprint in it. Because every week, that's where it gathers. Some of y'all need to get up and move around. Not right now. But serving the Lord. Say, I'm going to do more. I want to do more. I want to be in the house of God. Those who plant themselves in the house of God, house of God shall flourish. We're laying at home in bed saying, oh, God, do something for me. Well, sleeping beauty, get out of bed. When Moses sent, off, uh, sent them off to scout out Canaan, this is when they were about to go into the promised land, And how many of you know after 40 years of wandering around, it's going to take a lot of faith to believe that this was worth it, okay? These people are tired. They're exhausted. I'm sure they don't even like each other that much. It's like, could we just get on with this, God? I mean, 40 years? Come on. And their clothes didn't wear out? That put Dillard's out of business. I mean, they didn't have to buy anything new. There was no fashion statement. And Moses said, okay, We're going to go in and spy out the land and see what's there. Go up through the Negev and into the hill country. Look at the land. Look the land over. See what it's like. Assess the people. Are they strong or weak? Are they few or many? Observe the land. Is it pleasant or harsh? Describe the towns where they live. Are they open camps or fortified walls? And the soil, is it fertile or barren? Are there forests? Now listen to this. And try to bring back a sample of the produce that grows there. Now, this is the most interesting thing because I think God's going, okay, I'm sending these 12 guys in. These people are exhausted, 40 years wandering in the wilderness. They're tired. Moses and the the 12 that came, that he sent in to come back, and they can tell you, wow, the land is fortified. It's amazing. It's got milk and honey like promise. It's flowing. It's incredible. Well, they had already heard the story that God said, I will bring you into a land flowing. They'd heard that story. But God says, you know what? It's hard sometimes for people to believe something without experiencing it. So he said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to try to bring back some stuff. Now, listen, you can go to Costco, Walmart, Sam's, anywhere you want to go, and you can get these little bitty grapes. They're just precious. No, no. These grapes are so big, these guys have to get a pipe. I mean, can you, I mean, can you imagine? Just, just play this out for a moment. Grapes the size of watermelons. It's like a family meal. They're carrying these back. Why? God says, I want you to see a sample of what about you're about to experience right now. Taste and see, I am God and I am good. And what you're believing for is bigger than what you're praying for. Some of y'all need to increase your prayers. Quit asking God to pay off your car and make him pay off your house. Quit asking God for a little and ask for more. God has more than you can ask for. And if you are religious right now, you're probably going to slam me, Facebook me, Instagram me, complain about me, go right ahead. God loves me. He's the defender. I just think it's so crazy on Facebook. Everybody posting stuff. You should be. Be nice. Don't use it as a slam fest. Be positive. People will like freak out. What? Somebody's positive. I just post scripture because I figure anything I say can and will be held against me in the court of public opinion. 
So if I post scripture, I just say, talk to God. I didn't write it. You got a problem, go to him. They scared to death. They won't do that. Our experiences can change when our attitude and faith shifts. Maybe your past experiences because of limited options and choices. See, I grew up in limited options and choices. I thought this, these were the things. You, you get married, you buy a little bitty house, you put a white picket fence up, and, and then you work someday so you can retire. What's the funny thing about that is you work 40 years, live 10 after. <laughs> oh, boy, I get 10 years to have fun. No, you ought to have fun your whole life. It's a sad, it's a tragedy that the mentality that most people have is I can't live the abundant life while I'm working. I've got to be honest with you. I can't live the abundant life unless I'm working. To me, man, I, I want to make a difference. I want to do something. I want to, I want to make an impact. I mean, it's just, it's just, it's in us. God made us this way. Go into all the world, whatever your world is. If, if your mission is to tell people about Jesus, you don't even have to have an employer to do that. You're employed by God. Amen. Preacher one time was so frustrated with this man that show up about twice a year. And finally one day he confronted the parishioner that he knew his whole family. He said, look, man, you need to become a part of of the army of God. You need to join the army of God. He looked back at the preacher. He said, I am in the army. He said, I'm in the secret service. Nobody knows. Because I don't show. You see, sometimes we need to get in that place where we say, you know what? I'm going to step out. I'm going to join. I'm going to be a part. I'm going to show up. I'm going to grow up. The heart of the discerning acquires knowledge for the ears of the wise. Seek it out. You see, sometimes God does things a little differently. We expect God to do one thing one way, and God decides to do it differently. You see, Peter was a professional fisherman. That was his vocation. And uh, he knew when to fish. This is really amazing to me. It, it, these guys that really are really good fishermen, they know when to fish. They know where to fish. They know how to fish. They know the bait to use. I mean, they're good. I know I, I've got a friend who is a professional. He's a dolphin trainer. I mean, the guy knows everything about water sports, fishing, and everything. So Peter knew this. And so they go out one night to fish. Fished all night. The Bible says that they didn't catch a thing. And these guys, you have to understand, they've been doing this. is how they live. So the next morning, they're exhausted, they're tired, and they're coming in, and they see this guy on the beach. They don't know at the time who he is. At least Peter didn't. And he yells out, hey, throw your net on the other side. Now, in their minds, they're going, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. He's probably an accountant, but he's sure ain't a fisherman. But they decided, what do we have to lose? They throw the net on the other side. We'll sample what this guy's saying. They throw it out, and the Bible says they caught so much fish, their boat began to sink. You see, sometimes God wants you to do something you don't want to do, something that you think you know better than God. But God says, I want you to do this. He said, sample and see if this is not true. Some of y'all, it's like be nice to somebody who's not nice to you. Forgive somebody that has harmed you or hurt you. They've been mean to you. You're going to be nice to them. That just doesn't feel right to the flesh, does it? No, no, not at all. You just want to reach out and slap somebody. That's, that's just kind of how we roll as humans. Like, yeah, we're right. Actually, your prayer every day, you're so faithful to pray to God. God, let me be there when you smite them, please. When they try to get into heaven, could I just be standing at the gate when you go, depart from me? I never knew. Yes, thank you, Jesus. 80 years, I got it finally. Wrong prayer. Be nice. Bless those who persecute you. 
There are parts of the Bible I really don't like. That's one of them. Bless those who persecute you. Really, God? I want to ask you to just take them out. But, see, that's not the right way. It's not right thinking. Right way, right thinking is bless them. Because as you bless them, you're sowing seed for your blessing. Oh, that, see, that gets a lot of applause. You, you hate it as much as I do. That's why none of you are clapping. Yes, let's do that. Yeah. Sounds like fun. Because some of y'all getting ready to go to lunch with people you don't want to go to lunch with, but you don't know how to say no. Okay. Oops. Third thing is study. Seek, sample, study. None of this happens without getting the word of God in you. Study, the Bible says, to show yourself approved, one who does not need to be ashamed. You don't read the Bible to impress God. You don't read the Bible to get the favor of God. The Bible says he blesses the righteous, surrounds us with favor as with a shield. Why? Because you're the righteousness of God in him. But when you read the Bible, it educates you on the things, the promises of God, what he's promised he would do. I'll bless you in the city and the country, coming in and going out. You'll be the head and not tail, above only not beneath. Though your enemies come at you from one direction, they'll flee in seven. Why? Because you're in obedience to God. I don't, I don't have to, it's not, I just know that you get that in you. So when I, when I have problems in my life, I say, God, here's what you told me. The plans you have for me are to bless me. Those are your plans to give me a hope and a future. Those are your plans, God. I have to remind myself sometimes because it's not based on my goodness. It's based on his goodness and my connected to, to that goodness through faith. Yeah, I want to do right. I want to be, be who God wants me to be. I want to do all those things, but I, I have a passion and desire to seek him. I've sampled and seen that he's good, and now I'm studying. Why? I want to get the word. He said, hide it in your heart. Put the word of God in you. Sow it in there. Let it begin to flourish, and you'll begin to make biblical decisions. You see, the world right now is swirling around a moral compass, and a moral compass is not like a biblical compass. A moral compass is subjective to how you were raised and what you were taught. A biblical compass tells us forgive, and you'll be forgiven. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Give, and it will be given. That's a biblical compass that is true north. If you don't read it, you don't know it. If you don't know it, you won't do the exploits God's promised those who know him will do. One scripture in the Bible talks about you don't pour new wine into old wineskins. Old wineskins are oftentimes inside the church made up of a doctrine of man. I grew up in one of those churches that told us what not to do and that we were going to hell if we did. (laughs) Makes you want to come to church. I'm going to church today because I want to be scared. (laughs) I go to church because I want to hear hope. I want to know that we serve a good God. But, But so what happened was, I went to this church, and it says if you pour new wine into old wineskins, they'll burst because they're brittle. But when you get born again, you become the new wineskin, and God pours his word in you, and it begins to expand his spirit inside your life. You no longer live by the doctrines of man, but you live by the biblical doctrines of God. And the Bible talks about obedient people. It says they'll eat the good of the land. So what, what does it take to be blessed by God? Well, you know, if you walk in faith and obedience, the Bible says the willing and obedience shall eat the good of the land. Are you willing? Are you obedient? Are you, I mean, it, it didn't say willing and perfect. Never make a mistake. It says what's the desire of your heart? The desire of my heart, even on my worst day, the desire of my heart is to bring pleasure to God. And I don't always do that, but I always want to. I have a huge want to. My will to fades every now and then. My want to never does. (laughs) Because every now and then, you know, you want things to happen that shouldn't happen. And you have to have a will to. And the last thing is soak. And this is where you simply meditate. And it says, keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. 
then you will be prosperous and successful. This is increasing your capacity to walk in the joy and the peace and the mercy and the grace and the blessing of God. God has not forgotten you. And God's not blessing people around you because they're better than you or because he loves them more than you. Instead of getting angry at their blessing, have a desire to get your blessing. And then when you do, you can be a blessing. Increase your capacity. Seek him. Have a desire. Sample the things of God. Sample forgiveness. Sample grace. Sample mercy. You'll see that it is filling to your soul. If you could do nothing but memorize one verse in your life, get up every day. And study that and say, God, today, nothing's impossible with you. I can do anything and all things because of you and through you. God, today's going to be a good day because your mercies are new every morning. I rejoice in the Lord. Just simple things that get your mind dialed in to true north and what God has for you. And just soak in it all day and let it soak in you. Let it marinate in your soul. And that way, when something comes against you, you don't even have to work at forgiving because forgiveness is already in you. You don't have to work at grace because grace is already in you. You don't have to work at giving mercy. Mercy is already in you. In other words, you're full of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father, thank you. For your grace, your mercy, your patience, your kindness, your gentleness, your power, your presence, your fullness. God, thank you. Lord, nothing's impossible with you. We could try to figure tomorrow out all day long, but tomorrow's not here. So we're going to live life to the full today because this is the gift from you. So Lord, today we choose life. We choose blessing. We choose forgiveness, we choose joy, we choose peace. We choose today, God. In the midst of our darkness, you will be our light. With every head bowed, every eye closed, there may be those of you watching right now, and please tell us where you're watching from, but more than that, pray this prayer with me. If you need Jesus in your life, it's not because you're good, it's because he's good. Pray this prayer with me. Say, Father God, thank you so much for loving me so much that you gave your only son to die on the cross for my sin. Jesus, thank you for giving your life for me. Today I give my life to you. I repent of my sin, and I declare today I'm born again. Amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time or to recommit your walk with God, please text the word SAVED to 405-500-1310. Follow the digital footprint there. And... uh, Just, you know, we want to be praying for you, and we want the best for you, and I believe the best is ahead. Don't judge where you've been. Look where you're going, because it's going to get better and better. This time, we want to receive our tithes and offerings. And this is a sample situation here. When I got born again, I had heard, if you give, it'll be given. I heard, if you bring the whole tithe in, God would open the... I heard that. But it wasn't until I sampled that that I began to see the fruit of that. It's as dumb as you praying for an apple tree without putting apple seed in the ground. God, I want an apple tree. God says, well, get seed, plant it, water it, make it happen. You're asking God to do something without doing anything yourself. And God says, let's put the two together. Faith without works is dead. Listen, several things here that'll help you. Giving encourages us to be unselfish. In other words, it's a selfless act when you choose to sacrifice currency and say, God, I trust you with the 90% that I have left. Secondly, giving brings others needed relief and encouragement when you give. Giving forces us out of our own tight radius world. Number four, uh giving keeps us from becoming too attached to material things. Number five, giving models the life that Christ lived. These are reasons that we give, folks. And, and, and I'm going to tell you, you don't even have to worry 
about praying over your, I mean, you, you should pray over it, but God is a God of promise. He's not a man that he should lie. So when he says, if you give, I'm going to give back good measure, press down, shaking together and running over. He's going to do that. Uh, and, number, and I'll tell you, I'll, I'll even say this. I've watched him do it to people who weren't believers, but they were generous. It's a principle of God. And, and that when you tithe and bring the 10th, he said, I'll open heaven. He said, then I'll rebuke the devourer who comes to steal the blessing. Important that we get this in us. So sample today. If you want to give, there's a QR code right up here. You can put your smartphone on that. It will direct you to a giving platform. Or you can text the word GIVE to 405-546-2226. Very simple. Set it up. Debit card, credit card. Doesn't matter. You can, you can do it 24-7, seven, seven days a week, all the time. You can do it anytime you want. You can give on your way out. You can mail it to 5821 Northwest Expressway, Oklahoma City, 73132. Or you can also go to our website, mosaicokc.church forward slash give. I want to thank you for that, okay? Um, before we leave the gathering, we're having, a, it's, it's, it's a fun time. It's a potluck, bingo, 6 o'clock Friday, September the 6th. So it's almost two weeks away, but get that on your calendar. And at 6 to 7.30, I will not preach. That'll make some of you happy, some of you mad. It's a fun time. We have our own little bingo thing. We eat, we fellowship, we have fun. If you're not into that, then don't come. <laughs> Just want you to know we have a good time. And religious people are not really big on having a good time. They think it's anathema. It's wrong. We have fun. Okay. So that's September the 6th, 6 o'clock, 7.30. Also, women's Bible study starts Tuesday, September 10th, right here at the building at noon. Now, what we're going to do this year that's different, uh, or this fall that's different than the spring, is we're going to use Zoom. For those of you who can't make it here because you work or you live too far away or you watch online, you can do this from Africa. You can do this from anywhere. You can Zoom into this Bible study. So we'll have it all set up, and Jaden will have all that information for me. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. Uh, and, and so Kathy and Jaden will get together. Kathy's the, the, the teacher and then that way you can join that Bible study. I'm on a Zoom call with pastors from all over the country on Saturdays when I can join that group. There are probably 15 to 20 of us that get on this. It's a Zoom, and we, we have it's really a great thing. It's awesome. So if you want to be a part of that, sign up. Uh, and, and those of you that want to be, you can email us at mosaicchurchokc at yahoo.com. Say, I want to be a part of it, and then we'll get your information. We'll be studying, not we. I won't be because uh, it's a women's Bible study. Anyway, so... Uh, it's uh, Battlefield of the Mind by Joyce Meyer, and you do not want to miss it. it it's really going to help you. Okay? I'm going to ask our prayer team to come to the left of the stage right now. If you need prayer for any reason whatsoever, you want to receive communion, our prayer partners will serve you, or you can serve yourself if you need prayer for any reason. But if you just gave your life to Jesus, please go tell one of them, I got saved today, and I'd like to ask you just to be praying for me throughout the week. Don't be embarrassed. Don't be ashamed. It's very important. If this is your first time here, we have a gift for you at the Welcome Kiosk on your way out. Please stop by and pick it up. Also, if you want on my midweek call every week, you can text the word CALL to 405-500-1310. And those of you that say, you know what, I'm tired of sitting around, I want to serve, this is very important, please serve. You can text the word serve to that same number, put your name number on there, one of our staff will call you, whether you want to drive a golf cart, zoom around all day, you want to help out in here, usher, greet, whatever you want to do, teach, children's ministry. Thank you. Uh, you know, it's, it's the most important and the least desired by most churches, and I hate that. Children's ministry is the most critical area this church has, including my preaching, because we're teaching kids at an early age to value the house of God. So get signed up. It'll make my wife happy, which will make me happy. Thank you very little. All right. So anyway, we need your help, and so be a help. All right? Let's stand to our feet. We're going to go out with a shout of hallelujah on three, because we loud, and we're happy, and we're at peace. One, two, three, hallelujah.